Okay. <laughs> Marco, it's good to see you again. It's great to be here and good, good to see you um, and uh, your work. <laughs> yeah, and your work. We have our work all around us. That's kind of the role of the artist, right? That's right. That's right. We, we, we uh, keep making, we keep making beauty. Um, you know, it seems like even, even when, when you don't feel like it's right to do that. Um, it, we, it's, it's, I think, our task to continue to persevere and, uh, you know, remember that, you know, people like Frangelico were painting uh, when people are dying all around them of the Black Plague and, you know, Shakespeare was writing when uh, London was shut down and, um, you know, all these wars and uh, invasions were happening. So uh, we, we, we need to be mindful of that too. In your recent talk um, at the ARC Forum, you talked about how the artist is responsible for envisioning new future possibilities. Yeah. <laughs> and I wonder if you want to expand on that a little bit yeah, yeah. about how you see art as this catalyst for that. Yeah. Well, thanks for asking. I only had 12 minutes, so, you know, it was hard to expand on any of those points. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to really first behold, right? Pull back and um, rather than rush to judgment or action, you know, we really need to understand what we're going through um, as, as culture and even in critique of culture um, that we have inherited or we want to change. Um, it, it's really important to um, understand that, you know, first we have to first have, have a better story that uh, transcends the current times um, and at the same time understand the role of imagination and our discipline of making that we hopefully have been investing ourselves in, in um, that will allow us to even go beyond our fears and anxieties of, of, of today. You know, you're dealing with it daily, but it's a constant step to, uh, as I said, and I think I think that role of imagination is tied to, you know, this impossible command to love our enemies, right? And if your reaction is, well, that's impossible. You know, how can we love those people who massacred the innocents, you know, or uh, either side of the fence, you know, you, you know, it's, that's impossible, but, they, you know, that's where we start. <laughs> that's, that's really where artists start, right? We, we're we always dealing with the so-called impossibilities of making art, um, you know, we've been told since we decided to become an artist that that's impossible, right? Don't do it, you know, um, be, do something more practical, you know? <laughs> um, and so if you're making art um, for any length of time, you, you have kind of pushed through that wall and decided that it was worth it, that, it, you know, we have a narrative that keeps us going, but, you know, at any point you can stop thinking that way you know um and and i find this especially with people who found a little bit of success uh, that they kind of fall into this pattern of trying to preserve the success that they they've gained um and somehow it becomes all about transaction you know rather than making this impossible thing possible. And that impossibility is linked directly to how we imagine the future and how we, um, even, even the longings that we have in our hearts for the future. Um, so 
what I wanted to do was kind of open open a portal there to um, give people this possibility that uh, human beings are really made for this. I, I mean, we are uniquely made for, for this kind of journey to imagine the future and actually create it, right? So uh, an, an architect standing in the... <laughs> On the you know on the pit pit at ground zero, imagining right that that's first you know we create a building in our minds, envision it um, before it, it's you know drawn on paper or actuated, and on the other hand you know the the, the terrorists who flew the plane into. World Trade Towers, they also imagined that act over and over until it was actualized. So so we swim in the ecosystem of imagined actions and we can't stop but do this as human beings. If we let our imagination be taken over by fear and hatred, let's say, we will create a world full of fear and hatred. Um, but if we steward our imagination toward love and beauty, you know, we will be creating a world, uh, world that is full of love and beauty, despite what, what uh, we, we face. Yeah. And in that same talk, you also spoke about the importance of looking at art for a really long time. Yeah. Like, yeah. well, what people would perceive as a long time. Like yeah. you don't begin to see a painting until you've looked at it for 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and so for those that are unaccustomed to looking at art for such duration, yeah. what are some of the entry points that you look for in work? And how, do you, how have you developed hmm. that patient practice yeah. and that imaginative practice? That, that's a... Really good question. Um, and, you know, actually, I, we went to the Rothko exhibit, uh, Louis Vuitton Foundation in Paris af after I spoke at, uh, in UK. And I was thinking about that because the, the foundation is this fantastic building by Frank Gehry. I think it's one of the most imaginative buildings he, he he's built. Um, and uh, it looks like this arc about to take off, you know? <laughs> and I was thinking how important it is to meander the, the building a little bit um, before you go in there. For, fortunately, this is set up in, in this garden and almost like a wilderness where um, Marcel Proust <laughs> lived and wrote, and um, it just has a fantastic air to it. But, you know, I... And and all of that, right? You you bring into beholding. You you start the journey, perhaps even way before you enter, you know, into a museum or stand in front of a work of art. You know, you um, certainly think about it. Um, you know, if you love art, you, you know, you're always thinking about it. But um, you know, in this case, it made me think about how important it is the, the, for, for kind of a pilgrimage to get to stand in front of this, this work that, you know, you have seen before. A lot of it is from uh, Seagram collection uh, uh, in, in Britain and other places and, and Phillips and, you know, other places. So I've seen these works, but, you know, there's this kind of anticipation of pre preparing your heart, <laughs> you know, to receive something. And so, so I think that's, that must be part of it is, is, the, um, you know, having this pilgrimage attitude about it and um, you almost, you know, a world of Instagram where you get access to images instantaneously, but you don't have that, you know, you don't have that journey. Um, is not likely to, right, give us um, at least this deeper experience of encounter encountering a work of art or thinking about how, you know, this painting, may 
cause us to think about the world differently. You know, like you want it, you want the work of art to challenge you to, um, to even, you know, push you uh, in in directions that perhaps you're a little bit uncomfortable. You know, um, and and then and then that kind of invitation to behold starts this conversation. So. You know, in my case, since I have been reading Rothko's writings, right, so that I can write that afterwards, and um, you know, and during the pandemic too, I, I I was thinking about what he was thinking about in 1940s and so forth, even before he found his voice. You know, which which is really, I think, something that I encourage younger artists to do you know read his writings because they did this like way before he found this voice you know and and he's so confident you know like and and and, and stubborn about you know the purity of art that he's looking for and you know he writes about loving Rembrandt and learning from Milton Avery and then and then deciding that the figure is not the answer anymore you know, and 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 this exhibit does a wonderful job of showing his progression, and and how transgressive that was in 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 a sense because he was transgressing against himself, right? He was sacrificing what he loved in order to get to this pure form, and uh, and you can see his wrestling, and and so that voice you know accompanies you right and and you're literally having a conversation <laughs> with the artist you know <laughs> and and um you're sometimes arguing against the artist you know like I said, why did you do this you know and and those things i think are, are part of the incredible gift of beholding um that we can have with any any art form, music, art, theater, you know, dance. Um, it doesn't matter. Hum, human imagination has created something, an experiential reality that we get to walk into and and in a sense retranslate it for for our own purposes, right? So so there's this conversation and then the, there's this um, invitation. And then there's a reception of that uh, in 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 us um, that will generate hopefully something new to come out of us, right? So you know we, we should come away really excited about you know, oh what if I did this with this type of work or you know uh, you know these new ideas I think are generated when you do wrestle with the work of art and you you behold it. Um, so that's that's for me part of it. Now, I understand that many people don't have that kind of a, you know, um, perspective or experience. So, um, but, you know, I, I find that every single person has some kind of a modality to connect, right? So some, People may be visual, some people may be uh, more musical, you know, more somatic, more kinetic. Um, and whatever it is that you feel like you're drawn into, that you you sense this invitation, you know, I, I think it's it's worth cultivating because that's that's how we cultivate our imagination. Um, so when we are faced with this bleak reality of fear and anxiety taking over our lives. We, we have that as a resource to go to. You know, we, we might hear Beethoven or, you know, as T.S. Eliot did during the, in the, during the uh, uh, London Blitz, um, he couldn't sleep. So he kept on listening to Beethoven over and over. And that later on, that became four quartets. So the, these things are very important uh, to have literally, I think literally for survival, actually. Um, it's not just for entertainment, but it's it's really we need that substance to of things hopeful to really be able to you know face our uh, ground zero in front of us. Yeah, and what I hear you saying is that whatever your interest is, 
-hmm. whatever your talent that you have cultivated in the world is, mm -hmm. it is your mechanism of connection. Yeah. And, and creativity and imagination, right? Because, because when we love, right, uh, whether it be a person or, you know, Mona Lisa, you know, we, we, we are jumping in to that. We're taking that risk of um, connecting, first of all, you know, um, and, 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 and then we're generating. Love is always generative. So it, we, we are always creating in that mode. Right. Whereas fear takes that away. So we shrink, you know, and, and we, we, we can't um, uh, have this hope, of, uh, you know, to, 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 to even wake up sometimes, right? So uh, we're built for that invitation of love and so so this is all about being able to you know understand um how human beings are built for and built towards you know and 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 we're if we're able to behold well then that will resource us to i uh, actually love better you know to to be able to um share something gratuitous and extravagant into the world that is not expecting it um that you know that is so used to scarcity and and um you know perhaps even atrocities that when an encounter of love even in small ways can happen that, that can break open a new new path Where have you encountered love in art recently? Yeah, well, Rothko, uh, for one, um, but, um, you know. Was there a specific detail that stood out as like? Yeah, you know, there were some just really poignant moments when I was standing beholding Rothko. And then, you know, it's a museum, right? So people come and go. And you know, their children kind of running in and and then like standing in front of it, like <laughs> which is so great, you know, like like uh what are they seeing, you know? And then there was this lady in a wheelchair that just parked herself in front of a work. Well, it must have been like 30 minutes. She was just there and um, you know, and and it just made me think about just just that presence of beauty in in the context of you know where we are today and how universal that longing is um to be able to sit like that and you know it's it's really fascinating i you know obviously i was there to behold rothko but <laughs> what happens is I end up beholding <laughs> human beings, you know, in front of the Rothko. <laughs> and uh, and in some sense, I I do sense that Mark Rothko is a kind of an artist who whose goal was, you know, not just the art itself, but but something that happens to the viewer. Um, and you can, you know, this is a First of all, a very well curated show. It was curated by, uh, you know, the foundation people, but also Christopher Rothko, his son, had a lot to do with it. And you could tell that there was this intimacy created in the rooms. And so every single room was kind of a different experience. It was like a new revelation. You know, even though I had seen these works before, it, it felt like it was a completely new experience. And uh, one of the last rooms placed, uh, <laughs> maybe I'm giving it away too much, but uh, two Giacometti sculptures, you know, in front of these very stark paintings. And it was just gorgeous. I, I just, I just, you know, was just so gratified to see that. And, you know, and these pieces really did speak about uh, time, uh, you know, that we're struggling with this, 
you know, rise of dehumanization that's going on, the atrocities, the anti-Semitism, blah, blah, blah. And 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 yet the, this art just is speaking, you know, just so powerfully uh, for those who are willing to listen, you know. And and so I uh, I, I felt like yes, there was this um sense sense of presence of love, you know, in that sense that 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 it came out um, as an offering, as a gift to to many of us um, who, you know, I, I dare say we need it today. Uh, we we need that dose of injection of beauty and love <laughs> uh, through art and through these conversations. Yeah, that reminds me of Amundsen here in Los Angeles commissioning sheets to do the home savings and loan buildings and the yeah. mosaics that he installed there because people wanted to have their money in a place of beauty. Yes. <laughs> and it's not that supports a commercial commerce driven agenda. It's yeah. still, it still speaks to the importance of context yeah. and where work is placed and how it is able to affect change. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and how art can change how even those places of exhibi exhibiting these works are, right? So because Rothko was so stubborn about how the work is to be placed in a context of a building, in a context of a room, right? And that it actually changed how museums are built. Right? I mean, it just imagining back when he was painting these paintings and you know of course that became Seagram's commission and then return check you know thirty six thousand dollars or whatever um that that check he returned because it wouldn't fit in the four seasons mentality of you know this rich and famous eating you know whatever they're eating in front of the, <laughs> these paintings and and um and that act um, really just this insistence, right, for purity uh, again, you know, caused the Tate to say, "We can we have some of those paintings?" And and then the male family to say, "Can we do a chapel?" And of course, Rothko said, "You know." I don't want these paintings there, you know, in the Rothko Chapel, I, I'm gonna do new ones, you know. Mm -hmm. it, thereby defining the space again, right? The creating this, orchestrating the space thing. And how that, you know, led to so many museums building different rooms in different configurations and um, this foundation building, um, is is a really beautiful example of that. So you, you can see, for example, Agnes Martin being shown there, or you know, it's, it's it has more of a contemplative feel. Um, which you know, if you imagine a world without Rothko, that may not be there, right? So literally, this imagination and stubbornness to stick to his purity has caused the world to adjust to him and his vision for how we engage with the work, how, you know, even a child running in will have to stop and look at something, you know? And and to me, that's that's a really uh, spectacular offering that, you know, is, is often, I, I don't think we think about, you know, and, and it took sacrifice on Rothko's part to make that happen. And I also think, how your encounter with the Rothkos was changed because of the Giacometti's. Yes, yes. And yes. last week I was talking with my students and they were, there was a painting that I was showing them and it displayed gallery walls where mm. from ceiling to floor, there were just a plethora of different yeah. styles of artwork shown together, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And that's not what happens so much anymore. And um, yeah. to them, the word gallery wall depicts um, a curated Pinterest board of like 
very specific images that are all focused on saying the same thing rather than saying different things yeah. or the same thing in different ways. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think that that also speaks to, um, we talk so much about the siloization in yeah. social media yeah. and the, um, the divisive rhetoric that's able to amp up in these echo chambers of separation. Right, yes. And how, I wonder if you could talk about the importance of placing artworks in mm -hmm. conversation with each other as a metaphor for the mm -hmm. larger culture care work. Yeah, you're, you're right. You, you are curating the ecosystem as a word that, the, you know, so the architecture, the space, um, the, you know, the the wilderness around the, the, the journey, right? That that's all part of the design of art and, when you think about, for instance, the art of tea, you know, Sado of Japan, uh, Senoriki, the tea master, will carefully plan out the, from the invitation to this particular guest, but he will think through on the message that he will want to give to this warlord, you know, who is hell-bent on invading another country, to have that moment of stillness and peace um, to, to really help this person or maybe force this person to confront peace, right? As, as an act of transgression. And, and so there will be steps, um, you know, as you walk into through the gate and you walk into uh, the garden, which will lead to the tea house. Everything is planned. You know, if if there's a maple, Japanese maple leaf on 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 the steps, that is planned. You know, and so these careful attentiveness to detail um, of hospitality, right, and that art of hospitality that. Um, is part of the art of, you know, serving tea, but uh, then there's the art on the wall, there's uh, flower arranged um, very carefully. Each one is filled with meaning and, and, and a certain type of aesthetics. And um, so, you know, in terms of art, um, being so um, atomized, you know that that each each piece gets isolated and cut up, and then we're supposed to see it on Instagram. And um, you know, we our hearts and our bodies long for this integrated whole. So before long, I think I think we we'll find ourselves doing these pilgrimages, you know, to to have these holistic experiences, uh, you know, actual experiences with art or anything with, with um, you know, there are these places that, you, you know, we, we might go that, you know, takes a long time to get to and and then we have to walk the path and, and so forth. Um, those might become more valuable. And for artists, we should be insisting on creating that invitation, right? That, and, you know, to me, it doesn't matter if the number game doesn't really do it for me. So I, I, I much rather think about that one person or, you know, how, how do I think about these barriers that we have created in, you know, uh, how can we get the disabled to join us? How how can, uh, you know, my painting speak to the blind, you know, uh, friend that I have, you know, how, how do you involve aroma and experience? And, and those are kind of things that, you know, help me to, you know, not 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 be so stuck in 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 my own corner, as it were. You know, and and I I think that's precisely when when the time is shifting. You know, when they went from the salon style of 
basically power game shifted right to artists having self-expression and and um, agency to dictate right but now i think we need to move into more reality of communication that it, it moves beyond self-expression you know and and how each one of us creating a piece of work um is part of a whole that is you know somehow mysteriously right that, that we are invited into together now we don't, we don't know how that's going to work uh, in terms of logistics but we need to be open to that possibility uh, as artists you know that because we what we long for is this deeper reality of communal experience that uh, you know we get to have and and even even at the Rothko show you know you're with these people who are there to experience his work and and there's something there's a silent silent uh, witness there you know to each other you know and and when we understand that there is kind of a communal reality invisible um agreements uh, among the strangers you know there's something very powerful about that and and so i i i do wonder um where this is going but you know i i, I think because of technology we'll be able to communicate you know certain things uh, parameters better and better and define them but at the same time we have to push back and you know create this um almost like a alternative reality um to what digital media is telling us um that is authentic and real you know and and that may be kind of transgressive to how how we view ourselves today um and but but i i, I think that's what we need and how do you position your work within that future possibility? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question, Julia. I've been thinking about that and I, I don't know the answer, but I, I feel like per, first I have to be true to myself, um, what I have been given all these years to cultivate, right? So, um, you know, my pinhole of expression is, is you know, very uh, in my mind, very limited. But that's a, that's good news because I I I I should focus on that, right? I should refine that to the best of my abilities um, and demand that of myself, so that it can be part of a whole. You know, mm -hmm. and I don't know what the whole is. Um, it's a mystery. Um, I I hope there's a whole, but you know, it, it, even if I were to just do this tiny little work that um, stays true to um, what I have been given to do, uh, but not just self-expression. I, I, you know, that's, that's very limiting. Um, but as an offering that I know I, only I can do to the world as, as a gift of love, right? That, that's the important part. And, and then if, if you know nobody sees it, okay, that's you know that's not up to me. Um, and on the other hand, you know there there is this kind of um, mystery of thinking about uh, responsibilities as human beings, basically. To if you see something that is lacking. You know, there's there's a need for us to come up with creative solutions and imaginative ways to try to at least build a base baseline for it, so that the future generations, you know, don't have to struggle with the things that we are struggling with. Um, and that part you know, has compelled me to create I Am Culture Care as an organization, as, as you know, 
uh, many of the things that I do outside of the studio will be part of that. Ember's international work with Hajin, all of that. Um, and and so I I I am aware that you know I I as an artist is involved in creating structure for these bigger things to happen, uh, even if it's just a catalytic work that you know somebody else will take over at some point. Um, you know, and and so I I hope um, there would lead to some fruitfulness. Um, you know, it is tending the garden. You know, so so you have some options of growing something you want to grow. You know, and um, and hope that that would lead to fruitfulness that uh, can be a blessing to to others as well. And what I hear you saying most clearly in that is that. The making is the act of love. Like that's yeah. the context of it yeah. all. Yeah. Is I, that so. that's the the fountainhead of uh generativity is yeah. just loving action of creation. Yes, right. And and love demands that we become self-forgetful and and we are thinking about love in general, you know, love for materials, love for hope uh, itself you know that 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 the future generations will live in abundance and fruitfulness rather than sc scarcity and violence um all, all these things are part of that love i think and and love requires sacrifice you know rothko was so aware uh, that there there will need to be sacrifice of some kind this is you know when he died on his deathbed uh, were Kierkegaard's fear and trembling. It's uh, He wrestled with this idea of sacrifice, Isaac and Abraham, you know, all his life. And, he, you know, so, so that kind of set the tone for all that he created, which, which is his love for beauty, love for transcendence, love for purity of expression. Yeah. Thank you for <laughs> reflecting on all of this with me. Thank you. Yeah, this is very important. And I'm, I'm glad you got me talking about it because, um, yeah, it, this is something that I've been thinking about as, as we traversed uh, UK to Lon uh, London to Paris and uh, came back just, just on Sunday. So, yeah. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> so good.